So kicking off here in our cyber series with the chief security officer at Agora, Roger Hale. Roger, it's been great to know you over the last couple of years. So great to work with you in your most recent role. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things to discuss in the world of cyber over the years, especially over the last two years alone. So love to kind of dive into it with you. And, you know, we got Jay here at Diversa as well and kind of diving into a couple of different topic points. So Roger, welcome to the show. Oh, you thank you, Judge. Thank you. I made it. We're all together. Um, really re- appreciate working with Diversa. So really excited. And as uh, you know, I, I, I don't have many opinions. Well, I have a lot of opinions and love to talk about cybersecurity. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and that's yeah. great. And, and I appreciate you joining us uh, as it was, you know, Joe and I have been talking about this for several months about kicking this series off focused on cybersecurity. Um, and as I mentioned, um, you know, kind of our belief in our view, if you look at one of the core tenants that Diversa was built upon, uh, it's really kind of this intersection of funders, builders, and users of technology. Um, and when we started to germinate this idea, particularly with somebody like yourself, who is the chief security officer, you've been in this in, uh, industry for a better part of two plus decades. You, have, you also served uh, in a, a kind of CISO in residence at a venture firm. You've seen a lot of different things from a lot of different angles, both as a practitioner and an evaluator. Um, But that's really the underpinnings of this in this conversation is this bringing the funders, builders and users of cybersecurity together. Um, And we thought this would be a great way to kick it off, particularly with you. No, I really love I like the idea. Um, You know, there's a number of different um, groups of people within the the technology industry that have been doing and thinking about the same concept but bringing this together actually from the uh the the diverse side right the uh the people side of it i think is has been missed um and uh i i really love to be able to share my thoughts and experiences because um i am an investor as well as um a cso um as well as a technologist so um, I do have a lot of conversations. In fact, um, I was sitting down and talking about the role of the CISO and where it was going with another um, CISO last night. So yeah. this is this is a regular topic of conversation. Yeah, and it's it for us. It's a it's a digital form of kind of you know enabling, enhancing the community. Like I was just at a CISO retreat a couple weeks ago, a uh, three day retreat down in New Orleans, and it, like the conversations that could be had in that kind of environment um, around what's coming, what the challenges are, even including the role, like what are the challenges of being in the role of a chief security officer or CISO? Um, And it's evolving, right? Every day, uh, both from a threat perspective, you know, in terms of like, hey, are, are the, you know, are CISOs and chief security officers entering the boardroom? There's a lot of topics out there. Um, But I thought for this, you know, particularly we'd keep it focused on a couple primary questions that we thought of um, that we just think the community would like to hear from somebody like yourself. Love it. Love it. And yeah. And, and I hope those conversations you heard actually, you know, shapes and um, especially at that retreat, I'm sure that you heard and realized that the questions are the things that um, that security practitioners are looking, looking for and talking about and feeling about are as business related and business focused as um, they used to be technology focused. And so, 100%. you know, when we, when we look at any of this, um, the, the, the role is morphing and has been morphing for quite some time now into that um, business enablement and that business leadership role from sure. being a raw technology role. Yeah, it, it is clearly transformed. I know Joe, you've out of the two of us, you've done the most, Chief Security Officer CISO work. Uh, you've obviously seen it transform over the last couple of years. Yeah, it's been interesting to see the the point which you just made, Roger, in terms of the balance of the business side of the house and as well as the technology side of the house. That world is just colliding together even more so nowadays. And in the last, I'm sure there's a million different problems or a million different challenges that Chief Security Officers and CISOs face you know, on a daily basis. But in, in the last two years, since we've gone through such a dramatic shift, not only in our world physically, but as well as what that's related to in terms of businesses and how they approach their security, what are the top 
what you would think in your world, top two or three things that you feel you're thinking about every single day as you're applying the role of a chief security officer to a business and what's important. So um, the, 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 the top one that you're going to hear from everybody, and it's been out there for years and everything, everything is, you know, how are you protecting the, the everyone follows it back and if protecting the data. Right. But yeah. um, I take a little bit different shift on that. Um, and so the, w- one of the top concerns I have is how do, how do we actually enable the proper use of that data? And that's one of that shifts in the, in the role of a CISO is, um, you know, it, it used to be, you know, hundred percent around security and now privacy has come along and privacy has really kind of built that up a lot, which adds an additional question of, you know, what is the ethical use of that data? Yeah. Um, so, so probably I'd say the top one, the top um, concern is around enabling the proper use of that data. Um, for only the, pro- the 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 correct people, and so that's where the security aspect that comes back in. But it's really about the, about understanding the concept of business and how business works, so that you yeah. can assure that people people can make the right decisions. Because if you're not enabling that data, your company is losing its competitive advantage. Um, the second one, I think, is you know older than security itself. And that is literally insider threat. And that doesn't mean you've got someone who wants to do something maliciously inside. That just means that someone is so focused on doing their job that they may not start from realizing the value of the information that they're, they're working with because they're focused on meeting their goals, especially in this yeah. economy, especially over the last 24 months, you could say maybe three years, I would say um, productivity is so critical. But assuring that people have the ability to do that and that they do have an awareness, it's a cultural thing within companies to help that people understand that this isn't, you know, the wild west anymore. Just because you have data doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want with it. And, yep. you know, to, to, to assure that people understand the impact of what they're doing. So the, the people problem is probably number two. Okay. Some people argue with that, call it number one. But if I was going to, if I was going to label one or two, that would probably be it. So, okay. and, and under number one, that's where we've got everything going on right now around the world between nation state actors to ransomware that all climbs into that. So the, for the technologists out there that, that want to jump on that and talk, talk about, you know, the, the external uh, attacks that are going on right now, that all comes into assuring that enablement of the data, because right now, if you look yep. at those attacks, it's not just about protecting the access to data it's about protecting the whether or not you can still access the data and that's where a lot of the the um ransomware is going on the the i want to throw a caveat on there because one of one of the things that's really interesting right now that i've noticed is there's another impact of actually protecting uh reputation and cost because there's been nice. so so many people trying to move so quickly and um you know just watching where some of your cloud services can be impacted just by people out there crypto mining and they're, they're yeah. taking your money, they're taking your services and they're impacting your brand because they're out there crypto mining because it isn't what you would consider a critical part of your business. It's not in your business impact analysis. It's not part of you know your production network, but it is part of your reputation and they're out there, they're impacting that, which then throws into question whether or not you actually have a 360 holistic scope of what your business does yeah. and how you're protecting it. Got it. Yeah, I didn't think of that angle. Um, but, you know, particularly from the reputation perspective. Um, but as you can see, whenever there's a breach, whether known or unknown, right, most of them are unknown until you discover it. Um, you know, all these companies take a reputational hit when that happens. You know, there's there's a, an old saying out there too that um, you know really de- de- defines how you prioritize and criticalities within your within your program, and you know um, CSOs and CISOs don't get fired for a breach. We get fired in how we respond. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What are yeah yeah. So yeah, so like what what is the process and procedures and how you react to it. Um, right. Both from a practitioner perspective, but as well as a communication perspective, it's it's about the transparency anymore. And again, that falls back to the fact that um, it used to be that if you if someone someone clicked on your website, you own the data 
you know, you own the cookie, you owned all that information yeah. and you don't do that anymore. So um, there's been some breaches. I, I won't name names, but there's been some, some breaches, you know, lately in the news, how these businesses have responded and communicated, how the CISOs have gone out and, you know, communicated directly, you know, has made a big change on the respect and the trust within that process. And, and that's yeah. really, that's really that component right now is the trust. Absolutely. And you've seen companies do it well. And like you said, we don't need to name names. We've seen companies not do it well. Right. You now, and, and the, like you said, the overall impact of not doing it well is, is a challenge. Um, both from a community, like you said, from a practicality perspective, what are, what, what are you implementing? What are you doing to resolve it? But at the same time, how are you communicating to, again, the, the cybersecurity ecosystem, your partners, your customers, you know, whoever, you know, us as users that our data is sitting in, in there somewhere, um, how you're communicating to those vast, uh, you know, multiple constituencies is key for reputation management. A absolutely. And, and it's not like, well, you know, we're, we're going to minimize it to this and we're only going to send out direct communications to the people we may think it's, it's like, no, let's take take this opportunity. I mean, uh, there's a, there's a company I will name, um, because this is old, old school, this has been going on for years, but there was a, there was a credit card processor in the Midwest that literally got hacked four I think it was four times in three years. Don't quote me on yep. that part because, um, I can't, no, it's been a while, but they learned so much with that, with actually getting the impact at that point that they actually shifted their business model, created a new revenue leg of actually providing cybersecurity insurance. Yep. Because now wow. they were the experts in that area. So, you know, yep. that's that's the other aspect of this is that is that you've got to learn from what from what you're doing. And you've got to be able to, to um, take advantage of those opportunities to always improve and always do better. Yep. And and today, especially with how fast it is for companies to get canceled, how fast it is for individuals to get canceled, communication and transparency is really key. Yeah. You really got to share sure. that information. For sure. Now, <clears throat> off of that subject, because I think that is probably actually a good way segue into like how, how you're running a global business, right? And you're in the midst of that right now and looking at what mm -hmm. is, what is U S and Asia pack. And then obviously Europe getting involved too. Like what, what are the, what are the walls that have been created over the last couple of years, especially when you're talking about communication, because it seems like communication has become more and more of a part of the, the role that you need to really take ownership and responsibility for both internally and externally. So have you seen kind of the development of that, just whether it's from a political standpoint, from a regulation standpoint, like what, what, what are your thoughts? And, you know, with Agora being a real-time communication, real-time exchange platform, I mean, that's that's actually, you know, the sweet spot of if I'm doing my job correctly, this is really right. what I have to be thinking about, worrying about. Um, right. So here's the thing, though. The impact of privacy that came about where and, and it started before GDPR, but everybody falls on GDPR because that's where it came in with real penalties and fines and everyone had right. to actually write right. That's where there was looked, a structured right? approach to it. Right. Um, but that is probably the larger shift or thought process impact um, to really start and answer that question. Uh, when you look at the, the impact of operating a global company in that area, and I was operating security for a global company during that process. Uh, I've worked with global companies for way too many years. I don't even want to admit how old I am right now. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 that, that concept of operating as one company, but respecting the regional and local requirements has yep. really been a concept. And believe it or not, I learned that actually from sales and from go-to-market strategy of working with global companies, and then took that and applied that to um, how to operate, you know, policy and procedure and um, security and privacy, and and bringing that in from that aspect because sales has been doing this for years, and, and this, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, pl plagiarism as you know a form of flattery, yeah, you know. Um, but the concept is, is that if you're operating a global company, if you're looking at this one, you have to have that vision, you have to have that global vision. At the same time, you have to have those subject matter experts regionally or, or have some way to understand and educate because no one person can understand cultures globally. 
You know, you, yeah. you don't have the time to travel and to spend that immersion time to do that. So you yeah. have to have that network and you have to have that understanding and realize that you only know what you know, right? right? And, you, and you know what you don't know. But the biggest thing is you don't know what you don't know, right? right. And that's where that comes in. And the focus in the conversation really, start, again, builds into a culture of looking at, you know, this is globally what we're trying to do. This is how we're trying to set up a holistic strategy that is under, clearly understood by the entire company and can be operated and maintained. And then let's look at those regional impacts. You know, so you know, let's look at the, the new privacy laws coming out of China with Pipel, which um, has different thresholds of you know where you have to have you know what you have to do if you have so many people within your company, if you have so many records that you process. Um, yeah. And uh, the the impact that they have on Pipel actually goes much further than GDPR does, you know, for yeah. for, for operating within the Chinese region. And yeah. then you look at, at what you're doing in G, for GDPR and the EU, and everyone thinks that the EU is everything in Europe, and it's not. Right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, Switzer, Switzerland is not part of the European Union, as an example. Right. And so you have to be able to understand that and understand what that impact is, and and. The same thing with UK. They're a little bit different now since Brexit. They've they've stepped out. But then let's talk about Eastern Europe as well. Yeah. And how do we operate in these areas? How how are you understanding? You know, as being a U.S. company, as as you know, operating as a publicly traded U.S. company, looking yeah. at U, U.S. regulations from FAR to ITAR to um, NDAA and what that impact is. And, you know, understanding your business and how your business actually identifies and is um, how it operates, how it is considered and, and labeled by the U.S. government, by the Chinese government, by, you know, European governments, how they consider you, where you can actually sell, what you can actually transfer, how you can actually do that process. That's why those conversations are business pro conversations, because it's not about, you know, I got, hey, I got. I got WAFs and I got firewalls and, you know, I've right. got, got real-time vulnerability management. I'm cool. No, it's about understanding how to enable your business. And part of the job is to assure that the business can operate with the, yeah. with a low amount of friction in the areas that you're targeting for that go-to-market strategy to actually work that revenue. So it comes back to that business conversation and the, everything we're talking about right now are business enablers. You know, it, yeah. it's it's not a checkbox. It stopped being yeah. a checkbox a long time ago. And supply chain is one of the biggest concerns right now, which makes that no longer a checkbox because now you're part of the engagement of the entire business process. All of the um, support, all of the vendors, everything that it, that you do to come together to actually run a company is yeah. now impactful in that area. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and quite frankly, if you look at, you know, the, the supply chain, you know, arena right i mean you it, it that's exactly what we're talking about if you think about our community right like multiple companies multiple vendors are tied to one another whether it's you know underlying code um etc uh, it, it's certainly a uh, and obviously log4j being a kind of major event in it it's, it highlighted that there's some broad issues absolutely absolutely and and, and but then and that's there's an actual educational compact uh, piece of that sorry not compact there's an educational piece of log4j that so many businesses are missing and it's part of the education that is also that responsibility for a CISO's organization right is the, the yep. education on this because because log4j wasn't well i gotta go out and get a patch and fix it right. log4j was i'm using 18 different technologies that are impacted by log4j Right. And, and that could literally not just be a third party, but a fourth party. So the time frame, frame to be able to um, remediate Log4j was waiting for my vendor's vendor to implement and patch Log4j. So then they could release their new secured or right. patched version, which would then go to my vendor that would be released and released. And then I'd still have to do my testing before I could release that. And so yeah. this wasn't like, oh, I can just patch this all overnight and we can go from there. Um, and log4j opened up that a world of a, really looking at the different types of you know third party vulnerabilities and helps is helping people understand there's multiple different clocks out there and things don't happen overnight they yep. can't happen overnight because you don't when you create a software product you 
don't write every component of that because that's reinventing the wheel and that is not a sustainable process right you yeah know, there that's it's a glow it's a global environment it, you know there's different code different areas and you leverage those open source libraries you leverage you know um not just open source but any but different technologies to create that platform and to create that solution that is the service model that you provide to your customers yep. and all those components you have to look at and what that impact is and so again that communication and your your slas in that matter have to take this into a fact that to help people understand that it isn't as simple as going out and um you know reading a cve score and and, and just go download and update the patch yeah yeah no i it... It's Log4j is clearly one of many, but the most recent example of something that impacted the industry, right? Both you talk about reputation, credibility, remediation, all of the above. Um, it, it certainly was a, a um, it was a lion of a problem in, in the cybersecurity industry for software companies, CISOs, everybody. It's like, okay we got to go figure out where this is. And then, like you said, everybody was really impacted by it. Yeah. Yeah. No, and then that, that's, that's actually the biggest thing that if there's any, if there's any attorneys, especially IP attorneys that are listening to this later, stop throwing into your contracts that the SLA is, you know, is, is, you know, within a week to patch a critical vulnerability. Cause if it's a third party critical vulnerability, you don't even have the time to even start that process. So, right. you know, th that's where that understanding that education. And if we're not having these conversations, then it, it just goes back into that same process of unex unrealistic expectations because the universe that we operate in is so vast and so complex. Um, yep. I don't think I don't think anybody's out there is writing an entire code base all by themselves. To right. The there's, right. There's very few standalones from top to bottom in the stack. Right. Yeah. OK. Now, how does how does something like that translate in terms of the because I feel like the expectations sometimes just go through the roof. You know, I mean, expectations of, of tech companies nowadays is already you're in a very fast paced environment. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that need to get done, but there's there's a pretty high bar that you need to hit now from a security offer perspective, I feel like that's even more so. So as that kind of translates into, we'll call it high growth companies, right? I feel like whether you're a late stage private company or you're a fairly newly publicly traded company in the environment that we're in right now, especially in the economic conditions that we're in right now, like what, 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 are, the, what are the gaps that you feel like always come up, whether it's you're talking to a board, whether you're talking to just across the executive team or customers that you feel just need some more time to develop. Wow, everything. Can, can I say everything <laughs> on that? Um, bottom. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can throw that in there. We can let, throw that in there. <laughs> let, 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 let me start with the most important part of this. Um, relationships matter. Okay. Um, because everything, everything's a conversation. Uh, you know, the the different understanding with talking to your customers versus the different understanding talking to a technical um, executive board, right, or yep. a technical bo board versus talking to a financial board, right. So these are different conversations, and the, what makes these conversations work is trust. Um, so the reality of you know how do we do things versus is actually more important than what do we have to do um i i had a great gotcha question earlier on in my career i won't name the company but it was um over it was over 15 years ago and the the chairman of the board said roger if we give you more money and more people will we be more secure you know, and the answer, the answer is really simple. You know, it's, if you don't give me the right money, the right people and the right support at the right yeah. time, we'll, we'll never be able to even start the process. You know, um, that's the problem with a lot of the impact of uh, data breaches is that it's a knee jerk reaction to solve a single problem instead of truly look at what the under, underlying root cause of how that problem was allowed to get to that point. Yeah. Um, so, so the conversations, my conversations, um, and I spoke to my first board literally in 2005 is when okay. I had my first opportunity to speak to a board of directors. Um, but in all those conversations, 
those conversations are about what there's always got to be an ask at the end, right? Yeah. Um, talking to your to your CFO, talking to your CS, CEO, the same thing. There's there's got to be an ask, you know, because you're not just sitting there. Hey, everything's I'm working hard, boss, or hey, everything's perfect. It's like this is where we're at. These are things things are working on. And this is informational to make you aware so that you can have the right conversations. Um, and because I need your support in these areas, if it yep. escalates to this level, which it normally does. Um, but then there's the ask of this is what I need for you today, right? To be able to right. make this happen. And a lot of time that's, I'm going to send you a communication and um, it's already been gone through PR and everything else, but I need you to send out to the whole company. You know, it's an internal communication. Something yep. of that nature. With the board of directors, it's like, this is where we're at. This is where we're focusing. And this is the risk in focusing the, the budgets that we have in these areas. And this is what we could lower the risk if we had you know additional monies or not. And I, I've had conversations with boards where it was not about asking for more money. It was understand that we're at risk until we get this done and you can't throw more money at this problem. Right. Mm. This, you know, I need you to understand, accept this risk. This is where we're at. Yeah. So, well, that's, it those, goes back to your first, where you said it's not about more, it's about the right tools, the right people, the right funding, the right focus. Yeah. And you've really got to have a great relationship with your CFO for that and with, with your audit and financial committee of the board because yep. they're not used to hearing that. Right. Right. Uh, you know, they're, they're used to the, the government axiom if I don't spend all my budget, I can't get more budget next year. Right. right. And, and, and that's not the way that most security peers that I've talked to, we don't, we're not operating that way. You know, we're, we're not throwing additional budget and stuff. We're identifying because we're so stringently looked at for what we do yep. um, for and, and where that money is. And I'm going to take a quick shot in this process. CEOs and CFOs stop stealing from IT and from R&D to cover budget for security, we're a separate line item. And our security budget is actually separated between operational and EBITDA costs, as well as um, go to market and R&D costs. And so there's co there's um, the cost of revenue impact, and um, there's also the operational cost. And let's ha start having the right conversation because stealing from Peter to pay Paul is not solving this, it's just creating more impact within your organization. Yeah. Got it. Those are the right words there, Roger. <laughs> I'm, ta I'm taking my shot. I got, I got a chance. You gave me a platform. So I'm taking my yeah, shot. exactly. It's like, great. Stop taking money from R and D and IT. Let's find it somewhere else. <laughs> well, let's understand that, that this is a this is a, a cost in here, and 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 um, unfortunately, the way that this used to be measured was that um, infosec was a cost of it was a percentage of the cost yep. of IT, and that's not true. Right. That's yeah. not true anymore. No, so, at one point, um, at one point you it was, but it's broken yeah. out and it's completely different. Yep, and there, there, and then, uh, you know, that's a, a broad statement. So there are industries that you know it is there that are not into. Well, no, I, I take that back. No, every company is an information company anymore. There isn't, sure. there isn't one out there that doesn't have that inf information impact, that data impact. So I really don't know what company where you could just take and say security was a percentage of their IT budget. I don't think that's right. valid anymore. Yeah, yeah, literally every company has become a digital enterprise in some way, yeah. shape, or form. I mean, it, yeah. no matter no matter what your audience is, what you're selling, what your products are, you're a digital enterprise. Yep. So. Absolutely. Now, if you were to if you were to wrap up, Roger, and saying, okay, you, you've seen a development of security over the last how many years that you've been in the industry as a security officer? Not gonna throw the numbers out there. We know we know you're sensitive to that. <laughs> if you're to look at the next couple of years, um, your anticipation of not only the security industry, if you look at cybersecurity and all the tools that have come to the play table or platforms that have come to the table that are trying to aid you guys as much as 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 they can. What are the what are the new challenges that's on the frontier that you feel like will probably bubble up just given the direction of where the market's going? Um, so this is probably going to be a bad thing to say, and, and we're probably going to catch some heat for this, but um, there's a level of protectionism going along geopolitically right now and politically that is impacting 
the cost of doing business. Um, okay. And, um, you know, uh, you know uh, not, I'm not saying this is a bad thing or a good thing. I'm saying it's a thing that you have to add into your algorithm. You know, the okay. FCC, the FCC just came out with some new, with some new guidance. In, yep, I um, saw that. In, in that was last week, doing. right? Right, right. And that guidance actually impacts from a cost basis, from a procurement basis, and from a supply chain and creates more work, right? Yep. More work means more money, whether it's resources. We're at a point in the economy where every business is trying to do more with less because the eco economical impact is that um, EBITDA is going in the wrong direction. And, you know, uh, operation costs uh, you know, are not actually meeting the lower revenue targets that, that a lot of companies are hitting right now. And yep. so so this this work effort is going on. And the, the other thing in that area is the risk of actually, again, having those the right communications and educating your own team, because when you're looking at the economic costs and you're looking at the company, you know, oh, we're going to, you know, we have to do some type of cost reduction. So we may look at a, um, you know, a, a 5% riff. I'm being kind. I know a lot yep. of companies did way more than that. Right. So, so when we're going to do that across the board and it's like, okay, let's, let's stop and let's actually look at what the risk of just doing a blanket, you know, operational um, impact analysis. You know, if you do blanket in that and, and you just like sweep across, everybody's got to drop 5%. Are you going below your threshold of this is what it takes to protect this company? Is this what it takes to actually operate your business? Right. You know, not just from a security aspect, but from an R and D aspect, from a financial aspect, do, do you still have the right, the right number of people to actually process and evaluate, you know, you know, billing for your customers and assure that that information is correct? Yep. Um, or are you just sweeping, looking at your EBITDA costs? And that's one of the big risks that that is a business risk across all organizations today, <clears throat> because when they do a sweep like that, they, they're losing the actual risk impact of, am I, am I creating risk from now Am I billing my customers correctly? What's the additional impact of doing that? You know, am I giving away money because I'm not billing enough to my customers because you know we 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 shrunk that department that much? Right. You know, do, do do I have do I have you know enough people in the uh, security operations team to be able to respond on a 24 seven business uh, business model, or did I just remove that because the economics are so low? So these are some of the conversations that I'm having with my peers right now as we're, we're talking about this and making sure that we're at the right level and oof, conversations and we're having these conversations to help the business understand what the real risk is of trying to meet your EBITDA goals. Yeah. Mm. So it sounds like, yeah. you know, over the, if, to answer kind of Joe's questions, like, look, if you look at the macroeconomic environment, what's happening geopolitically, like those external forces are creating different challenges for chief security officers and how to manage the business and how to not only just give the advice, but in the council, but like impact decisions that are being made for operational EBITDA focused decisions. Right. The, you know, the, the other aspect of that is because especially with what's going on over in Ukraine and Russia right now, there's also that concern of, well, what happens if it's like, well, that's really, you know, a lot of that is impacted by, you know, what your business model is and what industry that you sell in. You know, there, there's, but there has always been sanctions for um, companies within certain countries around the world. This is part of the process you should already be doing today. If you haven't started this and you just start looking at this because of Ukraine and Russia and what's going on there, you are late to the game. Mm -hmm. But this is a component of risk management. Right. Yep, and right. Un understanding your business model, understand what that that impact risk is, even having the process of evaluating every whenever the sanctions lists are changed and the additional sanctions are put down, which just happened with the FCC last week. And yep. having that a component of how you operate your business should have been in place for years now. Yeah. Um, Again, there's a cost factor. There's what's your priority, and especially for for smaller and for startup companies, you know that risk is not anywhere on their radar right now. Their risk radar is a 
about making sure that they're actually you know being able to grow their business, hit revenue targets, because if they don't do that, they they're out of business next year. Right. Right. right? So, so so I don't want it to sound arrogant that I'm saying that every business has to have a complete you know risk management program, but you have to at least know that it's there. Yeah. And acknowledge and set it the right right priority. And that priority is not set by security. That priority is set by the board. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. So you got to have the conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And be part of that conversation around enhancing your risk management capabilities. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. Makes sense. I mean, I could see if you look at the world today, um, it's a pretty meaningful answer to the question. Like yeah. if you, yeah. you know, if you look at what's happening around the world today. And by the way, internet, st the internet is still in, it still works in Russia. The communication is still there, right? In internet with Ukraine, there has been some challenges in that area based upon, you know, nation state cyber attacks, but the internet yep. is still there, right? Um, the, the, the concept and the process in this, you know, for me takes on the human nature as well. You know, you, you don't just say, okay, that's a, that's a hot spot in the region, so we're not going to operate there. Right. Because that takes away from the humanity of those are individuals, those are people. They also have careers and lives, and you know you don't just forget about them on the global stage because there's something going on there that makes makes business a little bit more difficult. Let's let's sure. have the right discussion and let's look at the right risks and what that real impact is. Um, yeah, yeah. T telecom still works. Right? Yeah, internet well, still works. And if you think about it, over the last ten years, I mean. Um, those areas have had, seen a significant emergence of technology-driven businesses globally. Absolutely. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, there's no way you can exclude that just because of the sheer amount of talent and focus that was built up in the last 10 plus years. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, Roger, first of all, I want to thank you for your time. This has been awesome. And being the, the first part of you know, DP cyber series, no better way to kick it off than with you. So really appreciate the time, the thoughts, uh, really good content just in general that will continue to spur out into so many different directions within the industry. But, you know, maybe we'll have you back on back on the show for part two. So really appreciate it. Oh, we could keep my... going for another hour, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not shy. Um, and uh, I really appreciate appreciate the opportunity to actually like have some of these discussions because in, in my mind, we, we need to have the holistic discussions because we're too myopically focused. And, yep. you know, we're, we're talking about point, too many point solutions and what do you do and take it in a single conversation, trying to take away and not understand the unintended consequences of every action that we have out there. And, yep. and that's part of that business enablement of understanding, you know, what's the impact of the business in this process. Yeah, I could talk forever. I really appreciate the time. Love the questions and the content. Thank you for not asking what keeps me up at night because, you know, everyone knows that CISOs don't sleep anyway. So it's right. not what keeps me up. We're still up. It's still going. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's too, that's too generic of a question for us anyways. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no, I really enjoyed it. Love to come back anytime. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Roger. Thanks, Roger.